Christmas intro take one. I went crazy on the notes again. I can't help myself. Isn't that your job? Isn't that the whole point of this like thing? Like, if you don't go crazy in the notes, then it's just two guys talking about a prime minister that neither of them know anything about. <laughs> I mean, like, so, Sir Alfred Deakin. All right, wait, wait. I'm going to do the intro first. Okay. Oh, sorry. Can you count me in? And do the. Ah, uh, no, it's five, five four. four. Guys! <laughs> <laughs> You're mouthing the words again. <laughs> You're nodding your heads. <laughs> and then he's laughing. Who's laughing? He's like, it's oh, the yeah, guy doing it. The, he's just like, he's like, he like, just goes. It feels like a real laugh. Yeah, like he, he, you know, he's reacting in real time. <clears throat> anyway, great, great movie. Yeah. Everyone knows what we're talking about. Is your mic on? Yeah, it's not flashing, so. Great. Yeah, come in. You're right. I'll just see here. It's fine. No, count me in. Oh, okay. so yeah. Come here. I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm in. fine right here. Thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, five, four. Uh, welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Mr. Prime Minister's podcast. I'm your host, Chris Davis. Joining me always across this uh, lovely antique table uh, is my brother. And co-host, I haven't got a, an official title, but right now you're co-host, uh, Matt Davis. What would my what would my title be other than co-host? Well, is it? Am I just if there's two people? Then do you automatically get the co-host? I actually, no, title? you know what? Look, I don't want to I don't want to decrease my importance of this to this podcast, but I feel like you're the host. Oh yeah, without so, doubt. And I'm a I'm a participant. Like I'm a. Are you a guest star? A recurring yeah. guest star. As people ha- may have figured out by the title of the podcast, we, each episode, look at the lives, the times, the history of our great prime ministers. And there have been a lot of them, well, about 30 of them. So can I ask you, I mean, we haven't really got into this, but is this going chronologically or are we going oh, yeah, across yeah. are yeah, we going go. across the greats no we'll go the, we're going to go chronologically right so do you think there's going to be do you think there's going to be moments where we have a podcast that has to cover multiple prime ministers yeah well this is the of... one oh, this, <laughs> this is, is one of this them. Is the start of it okay. i didn't think about that until right now you said that actually so we'll probably you know what which is All a good right. thing because like this this man um for a, a lack of a better term he's he's probably one of the goats um of, of prime ministers i think out there um, Interesting, yeah, and he he frequently is, does rank pretty highly, and of course we're talking about Alfred Deakin, probably, and I don't know if this happens to all researchers, but like I related to him so much, and I'm not going to say that probably for every single prime minister I I do this, I'm like, I did it for last week for Edmund Barton, who I you know I can relate to his laziness, I can relate to his, um, you know ability to just give up on his kind of dream and do something completely different you know yeah I can relate to him as drinking and then alfred deacon so many things i can relate to him uh, about um well i can't wait to confirm if they actually exist those those, those relations there yeah but let, let's start with uh alfred that's your middle name that is my middle name yeah N- not after the prime minister after another legend, <laughs> yeah. uh, a family legend, but family we won't legend. go. We'll go into yeah, that. that's a whole another podcast. <laughs> um, but no, throughout my research, like very interesting man, like probably one of the most interesting po- prime ministers, to be honest, because um, he he was an anom- anomaly in so many ways. But I think I think I mean you, you probably find anomalies throughout the history of Australian prime ministers. He he was interesting in, in ways you never consider. Like his beliefs and spirituality, um, he never graduated university, which I think is in, in interesting. Even for those times where, you know, it's quite, especially in Australia, it's probably like one university. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's, that is interesting. I mean, I mean, did you learn anything about that? About like he just uh, prevalence of higher education in Australia at the time? No, well, I think, but even for like um, middle class people, I think if you're a man and you go into 
um, you know, these kind of professions, particularly if you want to go into law, you need a degree, which he did. He went to law and he didn't have a degree. He passed the bar at 21. Well, I'm guessing it wasn't a requirement of the time to have Probably a law not. degree. I don't know if it still is today. I don't think it is. I don't know. I, have to look I up. think it is. You reckon? You I, need a uh, yeah. To pass uh, the bar, I would. I would take a. Well, isn't, it, isn't it rigorous enough to go? Oh, you, you know your you know your stuff. I think. I mean, look. I having never studied. What about Erin Brockovich? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What does she need? She didn't a law degree. I don't know. She did Moxie. Have you seen she that movie? Moxie. She had Moxie, and I think she had a photographic memory, which probably doesn't hurt. <laughs> But it was really interesting about him is um, throughout his life, he gave up so many um, honoraries and awards, even a knighthood. He was offered a knighthood, refused it. Wait, so he is not Sir Alfred Deacon? No. I swear, I've whenever I've heard his name, it has been preceded by a knighthood. I think you're thinking of Edmund Barton. Seven button, yeah, or maybe, maybe uh, you know several other prime prime ministers at some yeah. point. Yeah, okay, that's Which, really you know, interesting. It's not, a, it's not an uncommon thing. There's a whole list of people who have uh, refused knighthoods. I think the most famous one is probably um, David Bowie. But um, really, there you go. Do yeah, you know that? he Why was a strict refuse? strict vegetarian. David Bowie? No, <laughs> <laughs> he actually yeah. might have been. I don't know. Uh, All those crazy people. Wait, are you saying Al- so, okay? I was gonna say you, Alfred Deacon was <clears throat> yeah. a vegetarian in those days yeah interesting i would never have expected that to be honest yeah he was um that must have been really rare i think so because like everyone loved their meat back then right like that's what they i I imagine what they they would always eat and it was very seasonal right so produce was so seasonal you would only eat veggies that you know were were in season well uh Um, hit me with a fact what years Without, I mean, unless you want to, don't spoil it. But what year did he become prime minister? It's like nineteen oh five. Okay, right. You're close. Nineteen oh three is the first <clears throat> time he became prime minister. He was prime minister three times, three separate times. Yeah, far out. Rare, yeah, yeah. First time was only for I think it was like four months. And then wait, um, there was prime minister. You're I'll get to that. The back. I'll okay. get to that. Yeah, I'll get to that I'll because that's like in the weeds around like he's um. Various prime ministerships. You're getting comfortable there, like I am. Um, so yeah, let's get through the let's get through the the tidbits, right? The little interesting things. Born 1956, same year as Ned Kelly. 1856. Yes, did I say 1956? Yeah, 18. Sorry, 1856. Just, you know, in case the pe- people in the comments are gonna. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, because we're gonna get so many people in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that, you know, you, you, I'd rather correct you and have people in the comments be silent than allow that to happen. Yeah. He died 1919. Well, um, he so, was three-time prime minister within the range of 1903 and 1919. Yeah. He's been 1950. He died pretty young. 1858, did you say? Yeah, 18, 1856. 1856. Yeah. So yeah, he was born I think the same around the same time as Ned Kelly, and he was there to see the, um, the hanging of Ned Kelly. He went to the actual yeah. execution. I think he was actually a, he was a journo at the time, so he would have been there reporting it. Oh wow, that's yeah. so interesting. So he was born in Collingwood, Melbourne. Oh all right, yeah. So yeah, he was a, he was a Melbourneite. So Barton was a Sydney city man. Um, so Alfred was was your Melbourne Melbourne dude. Um, Appearance. Let's let's talk about what he looked like because there's a photo, and I don't, uh, this is going to be, what, this is definitely going to be like the cover for our podcast. For some reason, he's there's this great photo. No one talks about. It. I don't know why anyone's like. I don't know why this isn't like our national flag. And, and I'll show it to you, but it's basically him and Ed, Edmund Barton sitting down, and he's they're both sitting on chairs, but his chairs like turned around like cool dad style <laughs> like he, like cool oh. teacher style oh wait he's like, he's like the back in the front yeah he's like and he's got his arms like crossed over it i was like is that i don't know if that's his decision the photographer's decision but like like this is the first time i've seen a photo from like the the you know the 19th century where someone's doing the cool the cool teacher look it's like yeah. hey kids that's like the first time that someone untucked their shirt in public like that would have been so you, go, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Like, well, we had their hat askew or something. Yeah. Have you got the photo? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't want to spin it around because I got, this, I got the setup here. So right. actually, wait, wait, wait I'll, I'll slowly. If I can pick that up. Yeah, like, that's pretty cool, right? Yeah. I'm gonna grab the, 
scratchy to say that. Um, uh, pressy figure, six feet tall, tall, dark, and dark eyed. Uh, so tall, dark head, and dark eyed. Sorry. Is um, this a description of him in yeah. some history? He's handsome, alert face, fashionably bearded. He spoke rapidly in a rich, baritone voice, which he claimed bore no trace of provincial accent, which I've no idea what that means. Like, does he mean like a, a, a Victorian accent of the day? I think so. I think I think, uh, and this and this is a this is something that uh, uh, Aussies have had to kind of grapple with throughout the centuries. Um, our, our accent, you know, it wasn't until up to like even like the seventies before people on TV stopped talking like an Englishman. Um, we we I think we were a bit ashamed of, of our accents. I it's reckon only, it's only very in, yeah it's only very recently in recent history that we've kind of shed that pompousness around our accents. Um, and but apparently they they even were ashamed of them back then. They just didn't like the fact that they sounded different to the Englishman because they, we still had strong ties with them. I think we wanted People to... People aspired to yeah. have that have that uh, level of, <clears throat> I don't know, sophistication still. Yeah. Whereas Aussie culture w- was probably well-developed into, into what it is now, or at least partially what it is now. And we also continue the tradition of giving a nickname to our prime ministers. So his nickname was Affable Alfie. What do you think of that nickname? Can I call you Affable? Middle name Alfie? Depends on what Affable means. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's very likable. He's very um, approachable. Okay. He was very uh, influential. He could talk to anybody. He had this kind of charisma in a way, and he's a very good speaker. Uh, more so than I think than Barton, because Barton was your diplomat, kind of like more of a coach, but... You know, kind of, yeah. That's a great way to, yeah. I mean, I haven't heard too much about what he did, but I like that descriptor. But, but yeah, for, this, is, this is Edmund Barton, but like, I think compared to like, when you, when you compare it to Alfie, uh, he's a little bit more, he's a little bit more statesman. He's a little bit more kind of, you know, rouse kind of support. He's trying to get everyone going. He's trying to get everyone kind of into, you know, this is, it's been three years since Federation that it, when, he, when he was elected. So he really wants to get the ball rolling. He wants to get shit done. Um, because for the most part, there's only, you know, three years, not a long time for, you know, for such a big country, they've only got a, a few things kind of passed in, in, in terms of legislation that they can really put their name on. So he had a really good opportunity, you know, the foundations there, he, he wanted to, he really wanted to be there. Hmm. Um, unlike Edmund who resigned. Um, he's, just like, he's uh, like, I'm done. Yeah. Um, but Quickly going back, his early childhood was really interesting. He, um, a bit of a bad boy. Oh, yeah? So he attended uh, Melbourne Grammar for eight years. He was a good student, uh, but he didn't exceed academically. He later recalled he had been an incessantly restless, random, and at times studiously mischievous pupil. Fuck, that's a lot of, like, long, old English words. (laughs) So he was a an troublemaker. Rel- relentless, random, and at times studiously mischievous pupil. Studiously mischievous. Does that mean that he like put was effort into his mischievous? Yeah, that's what it sounds like to me, yeah. right? Like he, like totally. he, like he planned pranks, right? Yeah, that, that kind of thing. He loved like footy. That. He was a footy guy. Oh, but it was I mean, a, he's Melbourne AFL. Yeah, footy. Yeah, 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 yeah. AFL, yeah. At the age of fifteen, he passed the um, matriculation exam to attend University of Melbourne age of 15 which is still quite young um and he wanted to be I a barrister i think that was common you reckon so do you know what's going to help me out here so again my knowledge of um military history australian military history so a lot oh, yeah. of australia's famous admirals they went to um the naval they went to the royal australian naval academy at like 11 to 15 Oh yeah, because yeah, like, they would graduate at like seventeen, eighteen, and then they would be yeah. like full blown officers. That's where you watch Master and Commander, and there's like a little kid on the deck. Yeah, and he was a midshipman, yeah. and then they had like like lieutenants that were like 
15. And that this is we're talking about like Nelson days. It's like, I think it's like yeah. 1700s. But yeah, no, it's interesting. Nelson days, the best, the best naval days, days I reckon. Best day. Yeah. Of the, my favorite of the naval days, <laughs> um, but no, I think that that I think that that kind of thing was probably more common. But oh, here we go. At the time, Victorian bar did not require a complete university degree for admission; only passing grades in relevant legal subjects. So he managed to do that. So he went to uni and studied a couple of he, like, yeah, legal went to uni, courses. Studied a couple, uh, like the following year, passed it, um, matriculation. And then, yeah, he was uh, by what, less than six years later, he was admitted to the bar at huh. the a- age of 21. Pretty impressive. Without ever graduating. Yeah, I think that's impressive. He must have been a smart guy. Yeah, he was a polymath. He, he was into a lot of stuff. Oh. Um, you know, it's really interesting. You know, I, I'd love to do like as we're doing this, you know, there's a little bit of analysis I want to do on, you know, roughly how smart were the people that were going and doing doing this job. Right. And a person who's a confirmed polymath you know to mm. you know that that's the kind of person that i've always wanted you know those are the people i want to be yeah. in in power to a degree you know there's a there's a fine line between working too analytical you know what i think though that i think he had adhd I'm, I'm pretty certain he had adhd yeah maybe i feel like that's i think that's part of it because you think about it like he didn't graduate he just wanted to do the stuff he wanted to do he, he yeah. obviously wanted to be a barrister he's like that's what he, that's his goal and he's like, I'm not going to do anything else. I'm just going to do that and then try the bar, get in, and then bam, he's done. Like and that's, he's I think that, that, that's the dream of a lot of um, a lot of people who can't go to university and finish those like those subjects they just really don't want to do. You know, yeah. like the the secondary course in Spanish, for yeah. instance. Like, yeah, I really, I don't, I don't want to do this. Up. <laughs> bring up my history. My uh, I didn't go my to university degree. Uh, maybe I've got ADHD. I don't know. I think everyone's got it nowadays. It's just you're just not a polymath. Of... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe I'm a polymath. Even though he was like a, he wanted to be a barrister. He was always he always had this creative element, and this is where I related to him because even though he quickly became a barrister in such a short amount of time, he it wasn't really his passion because he he wanted to be a poet. Um, he, he wrote poems all the time um, even even published them he wrote, he wrote a book of poems he wrote um, a lot of scripture as well he's a very big spiritualist which I'll get into in a second because that was a big part of his life especially early on in his life um, because spiritualism was uh, during those times kind of like um, Edwardian kind of late Victorian era like everyone was on the Ouija board man everyone was like every, like that was like that was like a Friday night oh so you're not the saying Ouija board. He, he wasn't a he wasn't like a well, oh, you said it, scripture, so he was. Well, a no, spiritualism man. kind of is really connected with Christianity still. Like it's not. It's it's kind of like the belief in. Gotcha. Like they still believe in God, so they're, yeah. not, they're not. It's not sacrilege. It's still connect. It's still very much connected with Christianity. Right. Um. So yeah, he wanted to, but he wanted to be a poet. Wrote wrote so many poems and wrote, and also became a journalist. He was a very successful journalist and um, worked with at the Age for years as a very successful journalist and that's kind of where he got his interest in politics and he met um the owner and editor of the age david simi david Smith sim i can't pronounce his last name s-y-m-e sim sim i don't know it's like a, he's like a he was like a scottish guy um also another another bit of a, he was a bit of a character as well that guy he could probably have a podcast in his own but he kind of took him under his wing because as a young man, like he was still quite, you know, early twenties, but you know, very, very talented writer. And so he wrote around the ni- eighteen eighty. He um, edited the Leader, which was like the Age's weekly newspaper. The Leader, yeah. Huh. Um. So this was around. So he was like twenty four at this time. So he was like an editor of like a newspaper <laughs> at the age of 24 i feel like it was far more common to have these kinds of roles back then right i don't know but no think about it right here's my here's my theory a lot of people were in back then you know we're talking about pre our grandfather's generation right and this generation my our grandfather's generation were, were those was that generation where you just you had one job yeah and you did that job and you just did it for 40 something years and then you retired 
Whereas I think, you know, even if you go further back, I bet it's I bet it's more like that. It's more solidified like that. So I think there were people, it's, it's probably less like, you just like, you could be 60, right? And see the new 24 year old come in and he just like, there's the editor. And you were just content with your lot in life. So I yeah. think it's I think it's I think it's acceptable, but I also think it's really weird that there was a twenty four year old in charge of a fucking newspaper. That's yeah, that's insane. But get this: so the year before in eighteen seventy nine, um, he stood for the, the uh, seat of West Burke in the Victorian uh, colony, like legislative assemb- assembly, and um, hey, I forgot we're not he, at uh, Federation yet. No, no, we're, we we're, we're, we're a couple of years like for it to like start getting real going, like. But no, it's still kind of simmering away. It's still happening. Yeah, when you know Barton's, you know, doing his thing. Yeah, you know, Parks is doing his thing. They're you know kind of talking away. You know, things are getting they're building the train tracks. Yep. they're fucking wrong. Developing you know? that white Australia policy. <laughs> yeah, doing <definitely>. being racist. <laughs> um, he was a very honourable person. So when he first stood, his very first kind of political appointment as a you know as a minister in the victorian uh, colony legislation legislative he um he got elected but then in his maiden speech he did his maiden speech to the parliament and then he said i'm resigning what yeah he um i'll just read the wikipedia here's like due to a number of voters being disenfranchised by a shortage of voting papers he used his maiden speech to announce his resignation so he thought that a number of voters in that seat were I just didn't have the opportunity to vote. Like he, he didn't think that enough people had spoken that I mean, if they did, they would have truly went with him. And he didn't want to feel like that honor was unfairly gained. Exactly. I, at the same time, respect that, but I also think he's an idiot. Like, you know, part of me wants to be, part of me wants to be honorable and, and, and like to think that I might do the <clears> same, but, but, you know, you kind of you kind of lift looking a gift horse in the mouth at that point, right? You want to be able to get into parliament, <clears throat> so anyone goes in it. Go, you should, really, it should be that if you want to go into politics, you want to help people, mm-hmm. right? And if he's so honourable, he should take that gift of being handed, you know, in whatever way this position, to then go and help people as much as you can. Yeah, but I guess I can kind of see where he's coming from because you really don't want to be the you know the 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 voice of a certain constituency if you don't represent that can you know if you're if what you think isn't accurate to what your constituency thinks yeah but i mean how often i mean as yeah anyway i think that's really interesting that is really interesting i love it yeah i love it it's like what politician would do that nowadays oh yeah no you know wins a win i don't know but you know like because a lot of power I think back then no one really thought that there was a lot of power associated with these roles, even though there probably was. They weren't getting paid a lot. In some cases, they probably weren't getting paid a lot at all. Yeah, true. In some of these uh, colony... Yeah, Barton was getting screwed, eh, for um, years. Yeah, to the point where he had to give up to, like, go back to being a lawyer to, to feed his family. Mm. Um, so when you say disenfranchised... Are we saying that it was an intentional effort to short certain areas on voting papers, or that there was an unintentional, and he just felt bad? Like, was it like what do they call it when they um when they rig elections? Like, is it like gerrymandering or whatever? <laughs> is that uh, a thing? Is that a thing? Am I... No, maybe gerrymandering. They don't say. They don't say. Just it's, says, not, it's none of that. He it's... just says like it's it was unfortunate, but there weren't enough voting papers and we don't think it's an accurately reflective election. It was so election. close. He won by 79 votes. But then he um, decided to, yeah, give it away. That's uh, so and interesting. And then he lost the by-election. So they had to do, obviously, he couldn't take up the position, so they had to have an election. <laughs> and he lost the by-election by 15 oh, votes. That's really interesting. So so the, the election that he won, which he then sort of said, look, hey, you know, this isn't this isn't right. We shouldn't do this because he turned it down. They had to elect the uh, do another election. Why wouldn't yeah. they just go to the person with the next amount of votes? That's not, uh, that's like, I mean, maybe I don't understand politics. Well, actually, let's rephrase that. I don't understand politics, but I would have thought you didn't win. Who got the next amount of votes? Okay, he's in. And I say he because it would have been a he back then. Well, they don't do that today. I think because it's a loser, right? So like. 
no one want like it's definitive that that person wasn't elected people didn't want him but i mean but, if it's uh it's we're talking about we're not talking about like one v one here we're talking about you know six six options and oh, he yeah. he was first no it'd be like two guys like, it's a small it'd be like a small rural kind of seat so it'd be like it'd be like two dudes okay um but i thought that was interesting yeah it's very interesting um, I'd like to see how many times it's ever happened in Australian polit- political history. Yeah, I mean, uh, he so he lost the seat again, and then but he won it uh, another year. Um, in so he won it the next year. It looks like yeah. Um, and also the he was offered to be the Attorney General uh, of Victoria that year. So he was like what. Um, I don't know how how old we've been been then. He so it was he the was, year before, right? Was, so he's like twenty three or something, <laughs> right? And then he's been offered the, the AG's office, like straight up, and he turned it down. Why? Why? He has convictions. Yeah, but he's very. I don't know. Like, but wait, like, he, he, you know, does he actually want to change things? If so, like why it. is he turning down powerful offices? And he wanted to do it his way, man. I'm going to do it his way. Well, I mean, he got there in the end, so I can't argue with the guy, but like... Yeah. Yeah. I don't, you know, whatever. I mean, we should also Go mention Federation, especially if it's like his first um, prime ministership. Um, he, along with being a journo, he was a barrister and now, uh, you know, part of the Victorian um, Legislative Assembly. Um, he, was, yeah, he had some free time to uh, talk about Federation. And he was obviously very, very much involved in Federation, along with Barton. The two were like peas in a pod, just talking about Federation, getting getting things going with Federation this time. Were they part of the same early. party? Um, I think they were. Yeah, they're both protectionists. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Another interesting thing. So he was eventually um, he became the chief secretary and commissioner for water supply. In Victoria, so this is before, still this is still before Federation, still before Prime Minister, but it lays it kind of lays down some of like the, th- the thinking, and like you become really obsessed with things and like really hyper focused on things like irrigation. So he's actually known for being the father of ir- irrigation in Australia because he he really wanted to take advantage of you know that giant body of water to help you know farmers out and that you know and just create in industry in that state yeah sure and so he went to um he actually went to america and toured around for like for like almost about a year and just he basically relentlessly toured like dams weirs um like irrigation farms he talked to like like some of like the biggest experts in the world around irrigation these two these two californians called it the chaffee brothers he brought them back to to Victoria to see what they can do with the land. It totally failed because there was a drought. There was a depression at the time as well. well he's so interested in freaking weirs. He, so. and I was reading like he he was that he was that impressive. Like he, he knew nothing about it. Like but he was just so passionate um, that he created like a document. I can't remember what it's called, but basically it's like a proposal. Um, Kind of like a kind of like a thesis hmm. on some of the things that Australia can do with irrigation to the point where people are like going like this is like thesis level stuff like he should get a doctorate for you know being um, this this interested and this knowledgeable what a guy. about irrigation yeah that's interesting Pop um, would love him yeah so he, been... father of um, father of irrigation and father father of the modern Liberal Party today as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> so well, I don't, I don't, I don't though, know. Even though he was a protectionist, he yeah, he created. I'll, I'll get to this later, but he created the Fusion Party. That's what they called it originally, the Fusion Party. Fusion Party because it was a fusion between the protectionists and the free trade guys to defeat Labor, because Labor was getting so much so, like so popular, um, and like some of their policies were kind of getting a bit dated, and uh, they just wanted to defeat them, so they. So he helped create the Fusion Party, which I thought was like great, Abe. Hmm. Yeah, they should, they, call, they should call it that. Well, it's just like Fusion has so many. The the word Fusion has so many more implications now than it did back then, right? Yeah. All I can think of is like 
you know, nuclear fusion. <laughs> That's all I can think of. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, yeah, at one point he wanted to invade New Caledonia. <laughs> oh, dude. That is great. I love a prime minister who's willing to take risks. That's this, a risk. Why? This is before Federation too. Why did he, he want, wait? He wanted Victoria. <laughs> it's not like he wanted Australia. He wanted Victoria. Yeah. To take its own initiative and go invade New Caledonia. Well, New Caledonia is interesting because it's. I think even today, um, it's owned by the French and, and the English. I think there's like there's like there's there's the, the there is some kind of partnership there. And even in colonial times, they, even though it was very contentious, uh, I think they still managed to like sort it out, which is so unusual, even for those times. Like, <laughs> um, I don't, I'm not too sure about the, uh, the like the complete relationship, but basically he wanted. So what Deacon wanted to do was uh, protect the interests of the English um, in in the air in the Pacific. Right. So so. Uh, maybe it probably because I know that it is a French territory now. Yeah, it might have been contested. But I think at if the you look point. at the flag, it's an English flag and a French flag. On no, the, just a on French flag. It might have been contested at the time, is what I think. Yeah, and then you know he was. I just... saw some the, I, in my research. I saw some crest. It had the both maybe, but you're right, mate. It might have been like during. Um, like the early days. Anyway, that the actual it wasn't called New Caledonia before. It was called um, uh, the 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 whole place was called uh, New Hebrides. New Hebrides. Um, but yeah, I thought that was interesting because he just wanted to like protect the interests of English there to the point to 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 the point where when he went to England um, to be the representative for Victoria um, for Federation. He argued with then Prime Minister of the UK, like, fervently. Like, he was still in his 20s, like, this young man, no educate, no education to speak of, apart from, yeah. like, high school, you know. Uh, and, well, like, went up to him and was like, dude, what are you doing about New Caledonia? Like, He had autism. <laughs> no, he definitely had autism. <laughs> It's seriously like he, yeah. you know, who no does like no fear of that um, established structure, right? Like, n- n- not even considering the fact that, oh, I mean, arguing with the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, yeah, or England or whatever that's called, I don't even know. Arguing with this person is probably not cool. Like, they don't, they don't, people probably frown upon this, but it's also could also, you know, he may not have this like complete part of his brain that doesn't exist there to to stop that to stop that interaction he may just all had balls right he may have just been like yeah i believe the, i think this is worth talking about right mm-hmm. which i would do about something if i was very confident about it but i probably yeah. wouldn't do it if you know you could just imagine him knowing a little bit about him and like he was so into football loved his cricket um you know was so interested in irrigation to the point where he researched the hell out of it and like convinced like two Californians to come down and like do something about it. Like, you know, um, and was completely and utterly devoted to his religion and spiritualism and, and to the point where he thought he was preordained for greatness. <laughs> That's he, so good. He talks about it quite a bit. Really? Yeah. He thinks that he was like almost chosen by God. Yeah. To, to succeed yeah because like he's like being like imbued with like these natural gifts that he thinks that uh yeah he would one day become something great you know i guess he was right yeah and like he had that he had the gift of the gab you know obviously like he could talk his way out of anything he could talk his way into anything you know? true um that's yeah. really interesting that um that spiritual side of things like let's talk about that I'm gonna... imagine if imagine if you had a prime minister bit that came out today was like god has chosen me i am bound for greatness and people were like yeah okay <laughs> let's let's vote this guy in yeah he we was covered. uh deeply introspective they say <clears throat> um uh, he had an intense religious faith sought spiritual transformation through mystical insight and the nature of god um, he married a woman who was um, also a, a spiritualist, and so I think they kind of fed off each fed other. Fed off each other. Um, 
he edited local zines for spiritualism. <laughs> like, he, he he what? He edited what? Oh, zine like you know magazines like you know like uh, vice you know like zines are like um, like street corner papers. I don't think it's anything. They don't think they're legit. They're called, it's called the Are you Lyceum referencing like Leader. what they used to call them back then, or is this a term that gets thrown around now? And Do I've you never know what a zine it. is. By by virtue of the fact that I'm asking you about this, a I zine is like uh, you know those things that no one picks up at um, you know it might it, it might be sitting at like the entrance of a car park. Yes, and they're like free magazines. Yeah, there's like there's like one for Canberra. Like what's the one for Canberra? There's like that. Oh yeah, like City issue. News. It's not a big issue, but like. But there's like people, people, people could put zines anywhere. Like, like it'd be mostly like punk rock ones. Like, but I'm just imagining like a punk rock zine, but it's all about um, contacting your grandmother with a Ouija board. Right. Okay. That's pretty much what the zine was about. I would so imagine. He, he edited these like free yeah pamphlets almost, and he wrote books about it as well. He wrote a whole book about. He wrote a book of like um, scripture, like his own. Like, yeah. Every day he would write his. Like, like Christian based, yeah. His yeah. own his own scripture. Like, how does that work? Like, scripture is like the scriptures of the Bible, right? Like, well, maybe not scripture. Like, uh, what's the what's the word for it? Um, I can't remember. What it, but anyway, he wrote a lot of books. Like, he wrote book literally volumes, like books that are still in like in, like um, National Library today. Um, huh. yeah. But but not just about spiritualism. No, mainly yeah, mainly about spiritualism. Oh, there you yeah, go. Yeah. When did he do this across when? his life? Yeah. Um, every day he would write kind of um, really lame, like, pick-me-ups, but, like, in a kind of very Christian way. You know, like, let God see me throughout the day and, like, you know, God shine through me and, like, I, you yeah. know, like, stream of consciousness bullshit, you know? like That's interesting. That's yeah. yeah, true. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's like, okay, so... So, but he, he, but he was into it, man. Like, he, he attended seances... He um, explored mysticism and the occult. Uh, he channeled mediums, so he got mediums in and channeled like. And where did he find the time to do this? He was like, you know, like running all over the world, finding agriculturalists. <laughs> he was arguing with prime ministers. He was trying to save New Caledonia. He was <laughs> he was trying to run the country at a certain point. He was trying to run Victoria at a certain point. Yeah, and then he's finding time to write several volumes of books about mysticism not only that is that he has to also then probably attend church like he has to also then probably you know yeah have have you know act on his faith he he was a president of the victorian association of spiritualists i thought i just thought of a really interesting um i, I hope that this factors into our um either this or future podcasts um links to secret organizations like yeah because yeah, like you, you you know maybe maybe not so much now or maybe it was so well hidden back then but i think later there's going to probably be some interesting um yeah link ties to you know masons and maybe i hope something. so oh man me too <laughs> me too i so i so wish that there's someone out there in you know previous prime ministers that how many prime ministers have we had 30 31 31 yeah they want, I think, yeah. There's got to be at least one or two that have some kind of like. And I wonder. My prediction is that they were probably the less effective, effective prime ministers. They were the ones who were like, you knew that they had some like association with. They had help getting into that position. Uh, you know, like they they didn't get in there by merit. You know, like this yeah. guy we're talking about, Deacon. You know, he got in there because he was Does smart, God count? and he was sorry. Does God count? Does God count? You well, yeah. Sorry. He had the greatest. He had the greatest um, help on his side in that um, God was. He preordained him for that position. But, but do you think? Do you think God, right, Master of the Universe? If if you if you're confident, if you're sure he has a plan for you, and the plan is greatness, that leader of Australia is the. You know, like, I feel like there are far greater aspirations in life, right? Yeah. For in the universe, we're talking about universe here. <laughs> Um, you want to you want to know a very interesting fact about him? I uh, that that's why I'm here. I no, but like, are you ready for it? Because it's it's really cool. He um he oh. may have represented. He may have defended um what some may believe um is the person known as Jack the Ripper. That is very interesting. Yeah. So um 
the, the guy's name who they thought was Jack the Ripper's name, his name was Frederick Deming. Um, and uh, he was a serial killer. He was like a convicted serial killer. No doubt about it. Killed his wife and like four kids. And he had, um, yeah, it was known for a number of killings in the UK and then moved to Sydney. And then I think he ended up in, in Melbourne. And um, he was caught. And this is the time when Deacon... No one knew, really knew why Deacon did this because he wasn't really practicing law. <laughs> he wasn't really <laughs> doing Because he had federal... Like, he was he was already still in the colony as a, as a minister, you know, still part of the legislative assembly. He's working on federation. He's been a spiritualist. You know, he's writing his scriptures. You know, he's doing all this stuff. And then this big case comes along and um, people think he really wanted to, like... Um, promote himself up like you know he was in he was in a good spot in his career where he really wanted to take advantage of that and so he took this big profile case the, he, he basically said the guy was like crazy he did he did like the plead insanity thing the guy didn't get off i think he got hung but <laughs> yeah so but, but but people looking back today believe that he might have been jack jack the ripper interesting yeah i think it speaks to his nature and i think it's like it's it's supported by the fact that he decided to not you know take that win when it was considered to be you know the the constituency was disenfranchised or whatever you know i think it speaks that he he wants to give everyone a fair shot you know he wants himself to have a fair shot but he wants everyone else to have the same i like it i really appreciate that thinking now that i think about it yeah that's what that's what they say here in this um they're trying to like decipher um why he did it in in this piece here um it was uh they, they said it might have been something like arising from his spiritual beliefs, his spiritualism, that uh, might, yeah, that may have kind of led him to go, you know, this is something I need to do. Something I need to I do. I mean, this. as far as we know, he could have had a message from God, picked up a Ouija board, and God could have spoken yeah. to him and said, you need to do this. I mean, I don't know. You're saying, you're sort of saying, like, no one sort of figured out why, but it could have been something mysterious, right? Was it out of the loop? You said he wasn't really practicing law. No. He just, he put his hand up to defend him? Is that what you said? Yeah. Um, yeah, because no one really knows about it because even, it says here, even his biographers treat this incident briefly and without explanation. Um, but he probably wasn't considered to be a, like a suspect for Jack the Ripper until much later, I'm guessing. Yeah, well, some people think he just did it because he, he wasn't known as a barrister and this would be a good way to go, oh, hey, I, I'm a good lawyer. It's a less interesting theory, but I yeah. li- but it probably is the most likely. Yeah, like the Occam's razor of the theories here. So, Prime Minister, let's get to that. Let's just get let's right just, to let's it. straight into it. I mean, we covered Federation the bits. I know. He defended Jack the Ripper. I don't want to go. I don't want to bring up Federation again. I'm, it's kind of boring. Like, yeah, come on. There. We first had enough term. fun with it last time. First term, September twenty fourth, nineteen oh three. Barton quits. Deacon slides in on in, coming in hot. <laughs> four, I think it was like a four month term. Uh, yeah, it was a dud. Yeah, it was. It wasn't great. His first, I mean, pre pre preordained. <laughs> You'd be questioning God after what four months and you're out, man. They're like not questioning it. He just knows that something else is coming around the corner. You reckon? At least another two times. Wouldn't you shit yourself though? Like I'm. This is why, again, this is why I relate to him so much. I'm like, I really want that, right? Like, you get, you get to that. It's, it's that kind of um, green at pastures thing. Like, it, it's not always green on the other side. It's, it's going, it's, it, it's going to be fucking hard work. But when you get there, you're like, this is not what I wanted. <laughs> it's like, what? This sucks. I mean, obviously, you didn't I don't want have it. that very often. In my yeah, life. maybe, maybe it's me. It's, I think it's a, I think it's a type of person. You're right. Because, like, I don't go. Like if I target something, I generally get there and I go. It may not be as good as I expected, mm. but I still, I still want it to a degree. Yeah. Um, well, I might take that back because he, he did become prime minister three times, so it's something he definitely wanted. I think so, but I mean, I guess it comes down to the circumstances of which he was only in office for four months. Well, I'm just trying to think. Is it four months or something? But it wasn't very long. I think it was like, 
like a knee being trying being accurate. And I was like, I want to make sure it's four months and not five months. Um, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't very long. It was like, yeah, no, it was four months. It was four months. Okay. okay. So he was only in for four months, but was that because he was just what? Like, so like holding the holding the seat after. Yeah, he retained left? government second general election, um, uh, for, like in December. So he had it from September to December, but he had to rely on Labor for support, um, and then he held on for the, those four months because he was kind of acting when Biden, and then they had the general election in December. Yep. And then four months later. Um, the government was defeated in Parliament over a, a Labour an- amendment to the uh, Consolation and Arbitration Bill. I don't know what happened there, but um, Deacon resigned, um, and then uh, the Prime Minister went to pri- the Prime Ministership went to Labour leader Chris Watson. So he kind of went, he kind of just uh, had a dummy spat. I think he's done this more than once too. <laughs> he did this again. Wait, he 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 got pissed <laughs> he resigned. off and resigned. Yeah. He resigned the prime ministership. Yeah, he did. He resigned. Did we say prime ministership. Yeah, prime ministership. Yeah. Okay. Um, they passed no legislation that first ter- uh, his first term. I mean, um, the first four months. Yeah. Uh, and the second session of the first parliament rose in October 1903, and within two months of the opening of the second parliament, the government had fallen. So yeah, not a lot happened. Um, interesting question how does it so when a like a law is supposed to get passed right yeah w- what's the process it gets like circulated right amongst everybody to say hey have a look at all this and then they go and they vote on it right in parliament yeah that's how a bill gets passed yeah they write it up well yeah. they get some people to write it up and then they put it to the senate but they have like set times where the Senate sits and they go and they vote on it at that point, right? Yeah. So has that changed? Not really. But the the rate at which we share information has changed, but the time frames in which we share, like the, which we approve laws hasn't changed. Does it seem weird to you? Does that 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 strikes me as strange, right? It feels like the political system doesn't that didn't shift with the advent of technology. And I only mentioned it because like you know, we, we it's, it seems mm. like it's bureaucracy to a T. I think you hit on one of like the big modern day problems that. And uh, I'm arriving at this independently because <laughs> I don't know anything about <laughs> politics. We know it's really interesting, you know, because like I see it from a from. It'd be really funny if I like just went to your computer and it's like just like Politico and it's like what you should post. <laughs> like you've been fucking reading up on like modern affairs. And... I do. I yeah. I can't. I don't even. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly care enough to go and actually research anything like this beforehand. Give it a go. You get sucked in. You really do. I really have to... It has to be really something, like, interesting. Like, honestly, it ha- would have to have some kind of, like, tie to the Masons <laughs> for me yeah, to actually well, go in. And... Spiritualism and Jack the Ripper, man. I mean, as interesting as they are, I'm not... I mean, like, that's interesting. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But if it was, like... I don't know. I, I'm a bit more... That's like random coincidence and something that I don't particularly agree with. Like, yeah. I think like him representing someone who potentially could have been, that's like interesting, but not wholly indicative of something that like was bit, was strange. You know, yeah. it could have been strange if we had a confirmation. And the spiritualism thing doesn't bother me at all or even get me interested. But if he... If it was like... I don't know. It has to be something bigger. Some more grand scale sort of conspiracy type thing to where I go and go alright that's interesting yeah otherwise it's just dry I'm not going to talk about anything about his other prime ministerships because then we're stepping into other episodes <laughs> so oh, right because yeah he switches so he switches to somebody else and then prime like, minister does nothing for four months gets nothing done in four months but as a as a dude I think I like him do you know who he reminds me of he reminds me of Pop you reckon but he's like what uh, like uh add pop pop <laughs> like pop knows pop studies man pop yeah focuses he's, a, re- he's a renaissance man like pop's a renaissance man i don't know about alfred deacon like i don't think i can't see him like in the ground well maybe not. He, he, he did like irrigation like that's kind of like a dirty job i can't get, i can kind of see him i mean he came from like a middle class family like not a working class family 
So, like, he, he didn't oh, have I that. think, I wouldn't say his life reminds me of. I think his, like, drive, oh, what yeah, drives right. him. You know, his interests are different, which led him in a different path to Pop. But Pop had the same, I think, focus on specific topics. You know, think about Pop's, like, knowledge around, uh, you, know, you know, Pop, when we say Pop, for anyone who doesn't know, that was our grandfather, who uh, he focuses on so many little things but gets so into them, those one things. Um and he's a very honourable man. Mm-hmm. That's what I think. That's yeah. what got me as well. Like Pop wouldn't steal from anybody. He, you know, he wouldn't um, do anybody harm. And um, he also reminds me of Edmund Barton a little bit because of his uh, drinking. But you know, that's yeah. I mean, it was the style of the times. You know, he wore an onion on his belt and sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, um, a couple of things to end on. Was he any good? This is a good one. Um, I mean, we we're only talking in reference to his four months here. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, you're right. I don't know. We like, if, if the think in isolation, one. no. No, I think this is for all of them. They're treating him as like a collective because they were they were within they weren't like a, they weren't huge gaps. It was like probably like the longest he was in prime minister for between it's probably like a year, maybe less than that. So wait, you're saying that. In so, total, so the next prime, so the, per, the Labor minister, I think he was only in for four months as well. Huh. So he was in so quick after that. Well, we count these as prime ministers, right? Like, yeah, we do. We go, we go, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. The first six years or something like that. You know what so, I mean? Like, you know what's he really? And this is this is probably going to be something we talk about much later when we get to them. Is you know when we had that span of what three or four prime ministers within span like, space of two years, it was like right? Rudd, Gillard. Rudd. Rudd. Abbott. Then... Oh, no, it was Malcolm. Malcolm, sorry. Malcolm. Malcolm, yeah. Uh, Abbott. Abbott, then Malcolm? I think it was Abbott, then Malcolm, and then Malcolm, then ScoMo, right? I can't remember. But, yeah, again, you know, a lot of turmoil in that period. But, yeah. yes. Um, because, I mean, it happened early on. It's yeah. Like, it was, it, 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 we just built this system like that right and we didn't see it early on flaws in the system yeah i really i can really appreciate this doing what i do in it where you where you build a system that has inherent flaws right inherent yeah. rules that can be exploited it's almost like bugs in a computer game you know if you find yeah. them you can use them to you know to get your way with the system i'm sure certain things i think what i'd be really interested in is to see uh, prime ministers who really game the system like who really like were politically savvy, you know, and legally savvy as well. Let's see what they did to achieve their goals through, I don't want to say subterfuge, but, you know, clever, clever use of the system itself. Yeah, we'll leave it there. Um, I mean, we've got two other... I really don't want to talk about Watson then. Jesus, four months. And I'm assuming he never came back into power. Nah. Yeah. But first Labour yeah. leader. And, um, <laughs> you know, I could talk about this for ages, man. I could talk about this for all night. Well, just let's hope there's some um, masons in there. All right, until next time.